All right, how y'all doing? <laughs> Enjoying Connect so far? Good. Let's hear it for Sean. <laughs> Organizing this great event, putting us all together to talk to each other and uh, enjoy each other's company and talk about lovely nerdy topics that we like. I am going to talk about the topic I like, which is what we've been working on, uh, Apple 10. Uh, if you don't know me, my name's Carl George. I work in the Community Platform Engineering Group at Red Hat. I am the team lead for the Apple uh, team or subgroup or whatever you want to call it, team within a t group or group within a team. Um, I don't know, we don't have strict d definitions for it. Uh, my contact in info is up there. I, I believe it's on the last slide too if you want to reach out to me. Uh, you don't need to scribble it down or anything. It's pretty much Carl W. George everywhere. Uh, to talk about what we're doing for, uh, for Apple 10, I'm going to go through a little bit of history first to help it make sense about how we got to that point. Uh, and so we're going to look back at Apple 7 first. So for Apple 7, uh, we had our, um, you know, the Apple 7 branch in the package source disk kit, and it would build against RHEL 7.0. Uh, it would get a disk tag of EL7 and just populate the Apple 7 repo. And about six months later, or what, I don't remember the exact time, and seven wasn't on a six month interval like we had, like started in eight, but uh, at some point, RHEL 7.1 came out and nothing changed for packagers. They kept targeting Apple 7 and populating the Apple 7 repo, but the actual build route itself got switched from RHEL 7.0 to 7.1. This made Apple 7 effectively major, major version only, uh, but it would always build against the current minor version of RHEL 7 which we saw later with you know, upgrading through 7.2 and 7.3. This approach generally worked, uh, thanks in mostly to RHEL's major version stability in general. Uh, it's very consistent. There's a lot of uh, guarantees that Red Hat makes to its customers based on how it's going to work. Um, but not everything's perfect. It's not 100% you know, static. Um, does anyone remember some real big upsetting change that happened in 7.4? Anybody? I'll tell you, but. OpenSSL, there's a big rebase of OpenSSL from 101E to 102K. Um, this was a pretty, pretty compatible upgrade. Um, I always mix up how go backwards or forwards compatibility would work, but uh, a lot of packages in Apple would keep working. It wasn't that big a deal for that, but any package that was rebuilt after RHEL 7.4 was released would no longer work on 7.3 or 7.2 or anything earlier because there were new symbols that were provided by the OpenSSL libraries. And so um, at the time, CentOS project focused on being a rebuild. And so right when RHEL 7.4 came out, CentOS 7 still had 7.3 content in it. So that meant that any Apple packages that got rebuilt would start being uninstallable on CentOS 7. Uh, and that took about six weeks or so to catch up. I went back and looked at the release dates. Uh, so that was a little short, painful period where uh, you know, if a maintainer was aware of that OpenSSL change, they could just delay doing the rebuild. Um, but if they did the, did the rebuild and then published it, then it was just like, okay, well, this will, uh, there's not really a way to undo this, so just it'll resolve itself eventually when CentOS catches up. Not really a great answer, but a short enough time period that people kind of, yeah, fudge it and look away. No, nah, nothing to see here. And then we'll keep going through 7.5 and 7.6 uh, on through the history of uh, the RHEL 7 releases. Does anyone remember what, what big upsetting change happened in RHEL 7.8? Anyone ever heard of image magic? <laughs> yes, yes, that one. Uh, so that release has a really long version string, but basically from 6.7 to 6.9 in that release. Uh, and that was a, quite a bit more disruptive. It didn't have as good of... Uh, uh, backward, you know, transitive compatibility as OpenSSL did. So uh, on that day, uh, there were Apple packages that stopped working on RHEL once RHEL 7.8 came out. Um, things that linked against the older OpenSSL, sim or sorry, image magic symbol. Um, and in, if packagers went ahead and fixed those problems and did the rebuild, then the package would have the same problem as before where it would stop working for, uh, for CentOS users that when they hadn't caught up. That, that release, I think, took four weeks for, for the catch up. So a little another narrow window wasn't too long where things were inconsistent and not ideal. Um, and to be fair, only effect, affected a small number of packages. RHEL overall still very stable. Uh, not a lot of things changed, but this was one fairly disruptive change that happened that uh, affected third-party repositories like Apple. Uh, but there was no real way to fix it. Um, 
you either fixed it now or later, uh, but for most people, they just kind of ignored it and then eventually got everything consistent. Here's the current state of where we're now, though, with Apple, Apple 7. Uh, RHEL 7.9 came out. We've been building against that since it was released, and it's just it's kind of static now at this point. It's still going. It's in RHEL itself. RHEL 7 itself is in the maintenance phase, uh, getting towards the end of its life, getting fewer and fewer updates. Um, the way I like to think of it, at a, a, an overly simplified view is that the red tape is hard more and more to get an update out. It's got to be something really important to push an update for it now. Uh, Apple 7 packages aren't always maintained the same way, but we try to maintain them in a similar way as the, the RHEL release that it's based on. So a lot of Apple packages, Apple 7 packages, are pretty long in the tooth at this point. They're on older versions. Sometimes that's required because the libraries they build against um, are stuck where they're at in RHEL 7. They're not getting updated, so the Apple 7 package can't get updated further. Now on to Apple 8. It started the same way as Apple 7 for the most part. Uh, we had an Apple 8 branch built against RHEL 8.0. Um, I didn't really touch on uh, the disk tag. Uh, that's part of the release field in the package, and that was just .el8 and the Apple 8 repo. Uh, but something else notable happened around this time. This was whenever CentOS Stream 8 was launched. Uh, and at the time, we didn't really anticipate that, okay, well, we'll need you know to do anything different in Apple, but as time went forward, we started noticing a few things. Um, we treated it the same way. We changed it from 8, RHEL 8.0 to 8.1 when the time came. Um, but we started noticing that there were a few packages that would get released in CentOS Stream 8. And at the time, I was on the CentOS Stream team. Um, and we'd release a build and notice that, OK, well, this actually has a different symbol version. Um, it's going to go into RHEL very soon, but it's in CentOS now. And it's not just you know a few weeks of difference. Now we're talking about a few months of difference. Uh, we can't really ignore this anymore. Um, one of the early examples that I noticed was LLVM. Uh, that's gotten it's under a different compatibility guarantee as far as in RHEL, um, but that doesn't really help you when you're building a third-party package that links against it against lib lib LLVM. It's a tongue twister, and then you you have different symbols between CentOS and RHEL. Um, Again, it affected a small amount of packages, but enough that we were noticing that uh, you know we're seeing bug reports and complaints about it. Um, and at the time of the 8.2, uh, CentOS Stream 8 already had 8.3 content and just always one one minor version ahead. So still very still major version compatible in a larger sense, but then the things that would come in real minor versions started showing up early. Um, around this time is whenever uh, we proposed the Apple Next uh, repository. The idea was that you know we didn't. It was only affecting a small subset of packages. We didn't want to rebuild everything and have a completely separate Apple for CentOS. That didn't make sense uh, because most packages would work, like the vast majority, like over 99% of them. Um, but the way, what we were thinking was that when there is a package that needs separate builds for CentOS and RHEL, what we can do is have a separate branch that gives the maintainer that flexibility, um, and that's what we what, that's what we ended up rolling out. Um, a maintainer could optionally request an Apple 8 next branch, and then they would uh, it would build against CentOS Stream 8. Uh, we would put a suffix on the disk tag, so it would be el8.next, uh, and populate a separate repo. The idea was not that it would be just a separate Apple for CentOS, but more that uh, RHEL users could just keep using Apple 8 and not do anything different. Maintainers that were focused on that could just keep doing the same thing. Um, but if you had a CentOS Stream 8 system, you would enable Apple 8 and Apple 8 Next, have both repositories. Most of your packages will come from Apple 8, but when you have one of those builds that's sl slightly different, you'd get a, like a higher release version from the Apple 8 Next repo instead. Uh, and it, pretty much, it proved immediately useful. I know Troy loved it right away because at that time, we had uh, QT 5.12 in RHEL 8.4 and QT 5.15 in, in CentOS Stream 8. So we were seeing one of those minor version differences that were upcoming that was not too big an incompatible thing, but still needed some rebuilds for third-party packages. And that, that work that he did using, I, I believe Troy did most of it. I, Neil probably helped some other people, but uh, I'll say the KD SIG overall, but it was probably mostly Troy. Um, they, <laughs> they did a lot of this work to make sure that all the, Q, the uh, KDE stack worked in, uh, in CentOS Stream 8 via Apple 8 Next, and then that work was immediately um, reproducible on 
uh, in, in main Apple when RHEL 8.5 came out. Um, kind of proven through what the whole grand scheme that we're looking for with this, that the things you see in CentOS Stream 8 are a preview of the very near future of RHEL itself. Um, I say re reproducible because unfortunately at the time, what we didn't think about was that there was no way to inherit the builds between the two. We couldn't just tag the Apple 8 next builds into Apple 8. Um, the builds had to be done again for the different build target. Um, but because it had been done once, it was like, all right, I know the steps, I know what I need to go through, I know which packages don't work correctly. Uh, and I, I like to think it helped a little bit. So it definitely gave uh, users packages that would install, which was what I was focused on. I wanted it to work. Uh, and for the most part, it did. Uh, we kept going forward uh, through 8.6, uh, 8.7. Uh, we saw more rebases of uh, LLVM. That, I think that's gotten a rebase in like every single minor version of RHEL 8. Um, QT had another small rebase, not as big as 5.12 to 5.15. I think it was 5.15.2 to 5.15.3. Um, some KD stuff uh, links against private symbols that are annoying and you have to rebuild it no matter what the version change is. Uh, but yeah, Apple Next came, continued to be useful and come in handy uh, as we move through, move through time and minor releases of RHEL. Here's the current state we're at now, uh, RHEL 8.9. And looking back on it, Apple Next, it did solve the basic problem. It allowed packagers to target RHEL and CentOS Stream simultaneously uh, when it was appropriate. And we implemented it as kind of a bolted on solution and it didn't disturb any of the existing Apple workflows. If you haven't heard of Apple Next before today or you at the time or in the past, you could have just kept updating your Apple package and ignored it and not known about it. And if you didn't have a package affected by one of those uh, differing libraries in RHEL, then you didn't need to know about it. So it was successful from that point of view. We wanted it to be kind of non-disruptive and just there for the people that needed it. And then here very soon, uh, we'll have a RHEL 8.10 release. Um, as Troy mentioned, it's in uh, May, I think, a couple months. And uh, that, that's also going to be the CentOS Stream 8 end of life. And that's when, also when we're going to retire Apple 8 next. It'll, it'll be archived. So let's talk about Apple 9 now. Taking the whole history lesson here. We did things a little different with Apple 9. Um, we knew that, uh, we kept getting feedback that Apple 8 was lagging behind on packages and needed more packages. Um, there were several reasons for that. We've, you know, everyone's favorite thing to pick on modularity was a factor. Uh, there were some other things with development packages and things like that. Um, but we knew we wanted to do better, thought about how we could do better with Apple 9. Um, I have a whole separate talk that goes into more of the history about the original plan we had and how we changed it. I won't do all, recap all of that here, but basically what actually ended up happening was we launched Apple 9 early and instead before the RHEL release and built it directly against CentOS Stream 9 uh, for about six months. And this gave maintainers a lot of time to get their packages done early. Um, and everything I've heard from maintainers, they've appreciated that, it worked out. And that led us at the RHEL 9.0 launch have 2,000 something packages, I forget the exact number, 2,400? I think it was in your talk. So we had a lot of packages at the RHEL 9 launch, more than we've ever done before, uh, which was zero basically. I think Apple 7 actually had a couple because they did a, a like an Apple 7 beta built against the RHEL 7 beta thing that like a few people knew about and built things, but not a lot. Um, but we had a significant, more packages than we've ever had at the RHEL launch before. Uh, the Apple, Apple 8 launch was zero, it was nothing. That took a little while to get out the door, it was late. Um, but at the ni RHEL 9.0 release time, that's when we rearranged Apple 9 to work like Apple 8 and Apple 8 Next. Uh, we switched the Apple 9 branch to build against RHEL 9.0, and then we had the Apple 9 Next uh, branch continue to build against CentOS Stream 9, uh, with the with the disk tag suffix and populate in a separate repo. Uh, that transition was basically transparent to maintainers and users. Once you found out about Apple 9 existing, you could just start building your package. You could request your Apple 9 branch and start building it. And if you built it, you know, on one month, it was building against CentOS Stream 9. And a few months later, it would build against RHEL 9.0. Um, and to me, that really helped fulfill, um, deliver something that we've been talking about with CentOS Stream itself, which was that, yes, this is what's going to be in RHEL, and if, you know, 
if something you build against CentOS Stream 9 today doesn't work on RHEL 9.0 in, in two, two or three months, like we did something wrong, but it should work and we're gonna put our money where our mouth is and do it this way. And it worked, we, we didn't get a single bug filed or not even aware of any bugs that were caused uh, by building it sent to a stream nine. So it worked out really well for us. Kept going through time again, uh, rel 9.1 and two. Um, and now we're on 9.3. This is the current state of it. But we're start looking back on things and uh, you know thinking forward again, kind of like we did uh, for Apple 9 itself, but thinking, okay, the next step's obviously 10, but uh, looking back, what can we do differently or do better? Um, one of the things that comes up a lot is that uh, users and maintainers will mistake Apple Next as a standalone repo. The thing that I said specifically that it's not a complete duplication of Apple, a lot of people still think it's that. And some maintainers treat it like that and build it that, like that. Uh, we see some users try to enable just that repo and they don't understand why does it require Apple release. And I'm like, well, it's, it's because of what it's telling you that there's packages in Apple Next that require the main things in Apple, Apple itself. Uh, there's also a maintainer decision process for when to request that next Apple Next branch. Uh, you have to think about like, are these libraries different? Do I just need to do a rebuild in Apple itself or do I need to request an Apple Next branch? Um, there's also a, a little bit of a pain process there where uh, proven packagers in Fedora can do just a rebuild and say Fedora Rawhide uh, or an Apple, but they can't request an Apple 9 Next branch on a package they don't maintain. Uh, we actually recently voted to change that. Um, we haven't implemented the changes yet in the permission requesting stuff, but uh, policy-wise, we're gonna start allowing that when it's you know involved in just simply rebuilding a package, but only for packages that have an Apple branch already. Um, and part of that is what we imposed on ourselves. We said it was gonna be an optional thing, um, but that has resulted in people kind of ignoring it. Um, and that gives CentOS users a worse experience. And I don't like that, that bothers me. So we're going through time again through all the rail minor releases. This is in the future, hasn't happened yet. We'll go through, you know, all the ones on the schedule. This isn't anything secret. It's on the uh, rail lifecycle page. I'm not divulging anything special. Uh, when rail 9.10 releases, that's gonna correspond to the CentOS Stream 9 end of life. Uh, and that'll also be the Apple 9 next retirement date. So for thinking about Apple 10, um, I kind of drew inspiration from Fedora and started looking at that and thinking about, uh, you know, Apple is part of the Fedora project uh, and we have, you know, our ma Apple maintainers are Fedora maintainers. Uh, what can we do that would be intuitive to a Fedora maintainer? So in, in a similar way we've been looking at the, pre the Apple branches, here's what the uh, Fedora branches look like. Uh, this is the current state right now for a short time until the F40 branching happens. happens. F38 and 39 are our current branches corresponding to the current releases uh, with the corresponding disk tags and repos. And Fedora Rawhide already has the disk tag for 40. Um, so the Rawhide, Rawhide is reflecting the next major version of release content. Does that sound familiar? Like CentOS Stream reflecting the next minor version content? Foreshadowing. <laughs> uh, so here very, very soon, uh, they already did the mass rebuild, uh, Relange, I think there's some of the Fedora, Fedora Relange folks around. Um, the mass rebuild's done, the branches are gonna get added pretty soon, any day now or any week now. And uh, then a little while after that, Fedora 40 itself will be released and uh, Fedora 38 will get uh, end of life. But also, uh, Rawhide will move on from FC 40 to FC 41. Uh, again, reflecting the content that's going to be in Fedora 41. Uh, a lot of maintainers can just focus on that leading branch and then make, make changes in the older branches when it's necessary or when it's appropriate or both. Um, and builds that are done in that leading branch, what's really cool is that they just get inherited in the next release. You can just maintain your package in Rawhide and if you don't get bug reports for the stable Fedora releases, just leave them because they're good. That's kind of, if you look at the Fedora updates policy, that's kind of what it aims for is that um, updates in the stable releases should be when necessary, not just because there's a higher number. So what have we learned? RHEL has, major ver or, RHEL has minor versions. Apple 7 ignored this entirely. Uh, Apple 8 and 9 couldn't really ignore it because of CentOS Stream. It kind of 
the gap between REL and CentOS uh, was lengthened. Instead of being a few weeks late, now it's a few months early. Um, Apple Next was a partial fix, but less than ideal. And so uh, the Apple Steering Committee, what we looked at was that uh, really the best way to fix this is to just embrace the fact that REL has minor versions and implement minor versions in Apple itself. So we'll launch it like this. Uh, it'll look similar to Apple 9 at first, where we have an Apple 10 branch built against CentOS Stream 10. Uh, but the thing that's going to be unique and different is we'll have a, a disk tag in the release that is EL10 underscore zero, uh, corresponding to 10.0 content. Because at this point in time, CentOS Stream 10 content is reflecting 10.0 content. It doesn't actually say it anywhere in the distribution, but it is. That's what, that was, what it's going to be. Whenever RHEL 10.0 actually comes out, uh, we'll shake things up. And instead of changing Apple 10 to build against RHEL 10, which is what we did with 9, we'll actually uh, add a Apple 10, an Apple 10.0 branch uh, and start a new repo. The uh, Apple 10 branch itself will keep building against CentOS Stream 10 uh, and get changed over to a 10 underscore 1 disk tag, kind of like how Fedora gets its disk tag bumped up over time. So the idea is that this kind of structure is going to be intuitive for Fedora maintainers, that they can build their package in the leading branch, and then when the time's appropriate, it'll get populated into the ne next release. Uh, those inherited builds are going to reduce that rebuild work uh, which will definitely make Troy's life easier with the huge KD stack of packages in KDE. But all maintainers, anything that, uh, anything that you want to build against CentOS Stream 10 uh, and you just do that one build, that'll be you getting it ready for the next rail minor release. Kind of like you're a rail maintainer yourself. Uh, this also removes any kind of decision tree and process around do I need an Apple Next branch? Basically, there's always just going to be a branch uh, we don't make maintainers in Fedora decide if they need a branch. We just create them over time. So we're going to do the same thing with the minor version branches here. That, and we won't be making maintainers request these. They'll just get created over time. We're, we're going to basically fork the, uh, the mass branching script tooling that Fedora RailEng uses and use it to create these minor versions, minor version branches. The idea is that this will have, give us fewer uninstallable packages. Um, it'll also give us a few other things as kind of a neat side effect. Right now, our archive repos for Apple are uh, they're hit or miss. We make them occasionally. Um, we miss it sometimes, but there's not really a guarantee that what you see in the archive, you know, symlinked as Apple, you know, 9.1 is 100% content built against 9.1. It's kind of a best effort thing that RailEng does for us, and people sometimes forget to file the ticket to ask them to do it, and it's not great. This setup here. Uh, we'll basically ensure consistent archives. Uh, everything that populates that, you know, 10.0 repo um, will always will have been built against 10, rel 10.0 content. Even even if we forget to uh, copy it over, we'll just have that directory there, and it'll be effectively an archive at that point once the version moves on and moves forward. It'll also give us per minor version retirement. Uh, we've seen a little bit of a problem in Apple where if a package is added. Now, because we see it in CentOS first, we see you know, a package added to CentOS Stream 9, and we know, okay, this is getting added to RHEL, you know, say, 9.4, the next one. Um, typically, Apple's stance is that we don't duplicate anything in RHEL, nothing conflicting. So you would think, okay, well, it needs to be retired from Apple, but when would you retire that? Do you retire it when it's added to CentOS Stream 9, or do you wait until it's in RHEL 9? If you retire it with, in line with CentOS, then the rel, rel users don't have it in Apple for a little while. Um, if you wait until it comes out in RHEL, then you have duplication that we're supposed to not do by our own policy between Apple and CentOS. So that's the state we're in now, and it's not great. Um, but we're kind of looking over it, overlooking it now, you know, because it's a short-term thing. We've, uh, we've done some work with rel maintainers to, to generally make sure that the package in VR, the name version release that's getting added to RHEL, is a higher upgrade path so that it wouldn't cause any problems where the Apple package takes precedence. Um, but that's, you know, uh, you, that's error prone and doesn't always work correctly. Uh, so we want to avoid that. The, this, this structure here means that we could actually retire the Apple package in the leading branch and leave it in the older minor version branches. So 
the package would be gone for, from Apple for CentOS users, but Rail users would still get it from Apple until their next minor version. This will just keep going on through time, through the minor versions. I have a slide for each of these, but I don't actually have something to say for everything. This is all in the future anyways, long in the future. This will be interesting. Uh, you know, assuming that RHEL, ha RHEL 10 has the same minor version cadence that nine, 8 and 9 have with uh, 10, or I guess 11 minor versions counting dot zero, RHEL 10.10 .10 will come out. That'll be also be the end of life date for CentOS Stream 10. Uh, and at that point, well, we could actually switch the Apple 10 repo to just build against RHEL 10.10 .10, um, and then have that going forward for the last five years of its life cycle. So that is our big grand idea. Uh, things are very much still a work in progress. Uh, we've started looking at collecting all of the pl different places we need to interface with to get it implemented. Uh, one of the first things we got done, uh, Fedora Relinj obliged us and created the package signing key. We need to get that into uh, a tool called Robo Signatory. Uh, we've started evaluating the changes that are going to be need needed for Fed Package, uh, Fed SCM Admin, and a few other things. Uh, we know there's going to need to be changes to Bodhi and Mirror Manager to make this all work correctly. Uh, so there's a whole pile of work. Um, I was hoping to have more things actually done by the time of this talk to talk about it by the time I uh, submitted the CFP thing, but uh, uh, we're still very much in kind of information gathering phase, uh, which is fine. There's still a lot of time, uh, but there's a lot of work. So we are starting it in earnest. It helps that I know that there's, a, there's the earliest uh, passing CentOS Stream 10 development composes that got out. So that's a compose we can start setting up in Koji and start, you know, proving that the builds work in theory. Right, Troy? I'm looking for you to start nodding and tell me I'm not crazy. <laughs> I know they're not great composes, but they are a compose. Yeah, I just need a build route. <laughs> uh, so that's where we're at now. That's the current state. Um, I imagine this will be a, uh, a lot of activity over the next year, getting this all stood up and implemented. Um, my goal is that we'll at least get, have everything up and ready, uh, a similar timing to Apple 9, uh, which actually aligns pretty well with uh, the state of CentOS Stream 10 at that time, is that about six months before the RHEL 10.0 release, I think the CentOS Stream 10... 10 content should be in a pretty good place that, you know, you could build against it and reasonably expect it to work six months later. Um, we're not really pushing hard to make it available much sooner than that. Um, we might have the, actually, you know, the infrastructure stood up and just not announced, like kind of a soft launch at first so people can start playing, you know, interested parties can stop playing, start playing with it, uh, which definitely happened with Apple 9. Once we had this stuff in the infrastructure before we announced it, people, certain maintainers were just like, oh yeah, I see this build target, I'm gonna start building for it. It's like, no, 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 hold on, we're not ready yet. <laughs> so I expect that. Uh, hopefully we have a little bit of a soft launch period. Uh, a few motivated maintainers can help us find problems with it and get er very early builds done. Um, we definitely got a little bit of flack with the Apple 9 announcement where people said, well, why isn't this package in there at launch? And I had to re-explain to people that Apple is just, you know, it is a place for the community to come and build packages. It's not a specific content set like RHEL is. So if there's something missing, now's the time for you to get involved and add it which is kind of what I'm, uh, this last slide here is about, is that uh, let you know that if this is all sounds interesting to you, uh, you should come talk to us. The Apple Steering Committee has a weekly meeting uh, where we talk about things like this and other things that are affecting Apple maintainers and initiatives that are being proposed to improve the lives of the maintainers and the users and make things work better. Uh, said Steering Committee has already approved this plan. Uh, the first, the early versions of this talk was just me saying, here's what I want to do and we're still talking about it and I'm not sure if we're going to do it, but no, we're doing this, buckle up, it's coming, and um, it, yeah, <laughs> it's gonna happen. Uh, but yeah, come by the meetings. Uh, we're also in, uh, in the Apple Matrix channel on the Fedora, Fedora Project server, and uh, come talk to us, and uh, come talk to us here at the conference in person. Now's a great opportunity to ask questions uh, in this Q&A or directly afterwards, um, and find out ways you can get involved and help. And I think that's everything I got. Any questions?
So first of all, I really like the 10 schema. I think it makes so much sense. So it really makes it easy for me. And let me know if you want a specific slide up during your question. <laughs> no, uh, the, the thing is, like I'm an Apple maintainer, I have one package in Apple, which is a game server in which we actually run for Fedora. On mine test. On Center Stream 9, yeah, we run mine test. But the thing is, like, uh, I, ju I just wanted to confirm my understanding as a community member far away from like Realm maintain, maintaining real packages. So I'm a community member. My interest is only having like LTS community in distribution in community package, which I did. So from that system which you proposed, it seems that I can simply forget about real minor releases, real branches and whatever, do nothing, focus on my stream package and like play with it. And you don't have any expectation for me to maintain the uh, like 10.2 branch of my package for, for five years. If someone yes. uh, appears and asks like, oh, I, I use it on rel 10.2, and you have a bug, and I will say like, thank you for using it, now maintain your branch. <laughs> and that's, that's the only expectation, right? Yes, 100%. And to me, a lot, that mirrors a lot of the way things work in Fedora itself, where a maintainer can focus on Rawhide, do their builds, and ignore what ends up populated in the Fedora stable releases, not completely ignore, but you know, not focus on, until they like get a bug report, hey, this doesn't work on Fedora 39, and then either the maintainer does care about it at that point, figures out the problem, or adds, them, adds that person as a co-maintainer to look at that branch and get it working. Absolutely, yeah. It kind of flips the, the Apple Next model on its head. Instead of Apple Next being the optional thing, the older branches are the optional thing. You got it. Thanks. Great talk. Uh, do you want to follow up? Uh, oh, sorry, I didn't see you with the mic back there. Um, as you saw in the slides, it only said like the 10.0. Go back a couple slides. Here, I'll come up here. <laughs> um, so there will not. It, oh, we disappeared. Well, you notice he didn't say there was a. Do any of them? Just stop. So when we're at 10.3. There isn't a 10.2 for you to build against. So even if they say we're at 10.3 and they said, um, I'm running RHEL 10.2 and this program doesn't work, you have no place to build it. And that's the current design by the Apple Steering Committee. But there is a caveat that if we get enough pushback, we might look at things. But that is the current design. Just elaborating on that exactly, I forgot to bring up that point. Uh, in the in this branching model, like at the time of 10.3, uh, the 10.2 branch will get retired. Uh, we're not expecting Apple maintainers to maintain you know every branch ev forever. Um, we're going to correspond that to how Apple's traditionally worked of following the current minor version of RHEL. Of course, people that have, are familiar with RHEL know that there is RHEL EUS, the extended update support, staying on a, old, a minor version longer. And as Troy mentioned that um, it's really nice that this model would let us add EUS support for Apple really easily just by not retiring it at that time and just set a different retirement date. But for the initial rollout, we're, we explicitly said no, no EUS now. We don't, want, we don't want maintainers to push back because it's too many branches to maintain. Um, we can change that in the future, you know, based on feedback and what maintainers are willing to do and what they tell us. Uh, and largely how well this works in general. If it doesn't work, it's for something unforeseen reason and it's clunky, we're not gonna add more branches to it and make the problem worse. I had a question, a practical one. Um, when you want to take over a package in Apple, you just uh, request the branch and you say, I want to build it for nine, and you open a ticket and you say, okay, I want to build it, uh, do you mind if I can? And sometimes you, you get uh, no answer for several weeks, I would say. Is there a process where we could improve a bit on like a specific important package, uh, having a way to review that maybe somewhere and to say, okay, the maintenance doesn't reply, but please go ahead and uh, take Yes, we have a process for that. Um, it's actually completely unrelated to Apple 10. We did this, uh, did we do it in eight or nine? Or Yeah, I think we started it in eight. Around the time of nine, we started a process called the stalled 
uh, Apple request process where exactly what you described, where you asked for, asked for an Apple branch, the maintainer didn't reply, you say, hey, I can do this if you just add me, uh, and they don't reply for, I think it's one week at first and then two more weeks after another ping, and then if they haven't replied for a three-week period at all, then you can open a, open a ticket with uh, uh, Fedora Relinge and get yourself added as a collaborator on Apple branches and request the branches you need and build them. Okay, great. Anyone else? All easy questions, yes. Oh no. <laughs> I love Neil, I like, I like giving him a hard time too though. This will be the hardest question you've ever gotten. How are you gonna deal with the fact that the Apple 10 unsuffix version branch is going to fall below all the other version branches in the sort list so that people don't get confused about active branches? So you say unsuffixed, but I don't see an unsuffixed uh, disk. Are you talking about the disk tag? Or, oh no, you said the branch, right? Yep. So like if you have Apple 10 0, 10 1, 10 2, 10 3, 10 4, are they gonna sort up or are they gonna sort down? Well, branch sorting isn't a thing that, like, like DNF doesn't care about what the package source uh, Git looks like. DNF cares about the release field, which is what the disk tag is for. Uh, the idea with keeping it uh, just a plain major version for the leading branch is that um, if we enforce just minor version branches, somebody's gonna come along and request an Apple 10 branch, not understanding the model works differently now, and then they would get, we'd have to code it up where they get a rejection message, and that's, you know, there's no way to phrase that right. I mean, you could phrase it where it makes sense, but it's still not a nice experience. So if someone hasn't been paying attention, uh, something kind of carried over from the Apple Next stuff, we want things to work the way you would assume them to work by default. Uh, so that way, someone that doesn't know about this plan can just request the Apple 10 branch, do things they've always done it. They'll get minor, you know, 10.0 and 10.1 branches, but if they don't have to know anything special or have any training ahead of time for it to work the way they expect it to. That's all well and good, and I'm, gr I'm glad to hear that. I'm just purely talking about the visual presentation in all of our <laughs> software. <laughs> I can't fix that. You should talk to the Packer maintainers. How dare you? <laughs> I'm talking about Bodhi. <laughs> oh, in Bodhi. Uh, so in Bodhi, there won't be an unsuffixed one, I don't think. Okay. Um, I haven't dove deep into the Bodhi code yet on how it's gonna work, but my expectation is, is that we're gonna have a set similar to, like at this point in time, the only thing unsuffixed is the branch. Okay. Um, the disk tag will have the, the zero suffix, uh, or the repo will be unsuffixed also, but in Bodhi it should be a 10-0 update in Bodhi. Okay, yeah, that, that was the thing I was, to be clear, that's what I'm talking okay. about is because. Yeah, Bodhi, Bodhi should have the major minor version through the whole, through each release. Okay, all right. At least that's my expectation now. I, I reserve the right to be wrong. I, I haven't written Bodhi code before, so. Okay, so as a follow-up to that, in Bodhi, the, is the one without the version in the branch, so just Apple 10, is that not gonna be basically Apple Next for stream? Wouldn't you want that in Bodhi? I mean, it is, it is targeting sent to a stream, but I don't know what you mean by uh, having it in Bodhi there. You're saying that the, the one without the, the minor version on it is not gonna be in Bodhi, but wouldn't you want it there for the- Well, it's gonna be in Bodhi, but in Bodhi it'll have the minor version. So like in this right here, you would ha have an Apple 10 branch built against into a stream 10. The disk tag uh, and the build targeting Koji notably will have 10 underscore zero. Um, the Bodhi update will have 10.0, uh, but then it'll populate the Apple 10 repo. Okay, so in Bodhi, they, there could be two of them at any given time, one for stream, the update yes. release. Yes. Okay, that answers it. Anybody else? I feel like I've gone over time, so I'm glad Troy finished early. <laughs>